And welcome back to a fresh episode of the Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, co-owner over at webchoiceuk.com. And if you haven't yet, check out my weekly email where I'm sharing actionable website and marketing tips, useful podcasts, free goodies, and much, much more so you can kick off your week with a bang. Why not give it a shot over at businessgrowth.email? Joining me today, I've got Stefan Hedebrandt, and he is the co-founder CMO over at Dream Data. Stefan, a warm welcome to the show, sir. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, it's going pretty good. It's uh, summer times are approaching here in Copenhagen, but uh, looking forward to joining your show. Fun in the sun, fun on the marketing podcast. Could life be any better? <laughs> sure. <probably> no. Could. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be chatting all things marketing and linking that marketing activity to revenue. So let's dive yeah. straight in. We don't like to mess around on this podcast. Why is it so important, Stefan, to link marketing activity to revenue to cash in the bank? <laughs> I think uh, I think at least this is the way I think about marketing is that you do marketing to produce pipeline and to produce revenue for the company you work at. Because if you're not doing these things, then you are wasting your company's money and the company's time and your own time because otherwise you know why why come to work at all and uh, <laughs> the reason why we want to be doing this particularly now is that uh, you know in these times where there's economic turmoil on the horizon you know yep. the cfo he's going to be sitting and counting his uh, peanuts or whatever he's counting and saying uh, where can i cut some spend where can i cut some cost and the first place he's going to be looking at is kind of, oh, well, where's the, all that marketing cost going? Uh, there's the active spend, but there's mm. also the salary. Are we actually getting anything out of spending all this money on, on advertising? And um, that's if you don't have that proof of how your activities are connected to, to revenue, you're probably going to be the first place that he's going to be, be thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes sense, <laughs> right? But... I thought marketers' jobs was to generate leads, not produce revenue. I thought that was the sales team's job. <laughs> that was last uh, last year, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, it depends a little bit about which school you come from. I think uh, for me, I've just seen when it kind of marketing connected for me in my career was when I started to be able to have like really rock solid proof that our activities were actually producing revenue like in the you know when you're a junior marketer you just celebrate that you, every time you can get you know make one number go up whether that's leads or you know organic search rankings or stuff like that uh yeah. that's good but you find out as you get more experience that what counts is is revenue and not uh not just you know proxies or vanity metrics related to 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 revenue so it you know it gets you promoted it helps you not get fired it helps your company succeed that that's why i think you should connect re revenue to or connect marketing activities to revenue yeah 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 and exactly right i mean if you can show profitable revenue as a as a business you're not going to go too far wrong as a marketer unless leadership's got <laughs> mental but yeah going a bit off topic you mentioned and this this is something i see all the time with our business but for some reason, whenever shit hits the fan, whenever things are going bad in business, why is it that companies always think we've got to cut marketing? Because you and I, as <laughs> we're both working in marketing business, know that's yeah. like a terrible idea. Because if you stop marketing, there's going to be no inbound coming in, no brand position, no brand awareness. And everything's yeah. going to go kaput. Your sales team's going to have a nightmare because they're going to have to do cold outbound all day. Um, everyone's life's going to be hard work. But why is that the natural instinct, do you think, for businesses that when things are rough, when cash flow is tight, when the economy takes a downturn why is it always cut marketing i think it's because uh, people are thinking a bit too siloed or singular around how revenue is produced uh you know it's the salespeople who does get the contract signed and it's extremely valuable the work that salespeople do but at least particularly in b2b where i've always been working Deals doesn't come out of nowhere. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of touches. It's a long journey. We just put out some benchmarks ourselves that said that the average, uh, you know, customer journey amongst our customers is 192 days and has 32 sessions in it. Out of those touches, the, the, the touches that gets the deal signed are the sales touches. 
but you know th those 80 percent leading up to that deal coming was actually market uh, quite often marketing touches right but you don't see that see it as tangible because it's the sales people who bring in their signed contract but what you might risk doing by, let's say, cutting the marketing spin is you kind of you're kind of so, what's it called? You're kind of breaking the the what's it called? Uh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot basically because yep. the seeds the seeds you're planting today are to be harvested in Q3 and Q4, and if you stop planting seeds, then there's no no material for the salespeople to work with. So what we're saying basically is the salespeople are taking all the credit for marketing's hard work. <laughs> that, would, that would be the <laughs> Typical uh, banter between sales and marketing. I don't. I actually don't see it that way. Uh, I typically go around saying that the quickest way for marketers to improve their return on ad spend is to make best friends with the salespeople, because as you say, like if you've collected, let's say you've collected a bunch of great leads, if the salespeople don't pick them up, if they don't call them, write them, or anything like that, you're just gonna have a marketing cost without any revenue con collected uh, connected to it. So you need to be best buddies with the salespeople. Go in and ask them, what types of leads do you like to work with? Which converts faster or better? Is there any like is there anything you consistently hear in the sales dialogue that you don't feel that we've covered? Uh, you know, yeah. let's head, head down to the pub, have a beer, and uh, try to make friends. Sounds perfect to me. Can't can't beat a beer <laughs> and a bit of marketing talk, a bit of business talk. Sounds perfect. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense, right? Because it's it's only what you see on the front end. I mean, if you're seeing contracts signed, if you're seeing deals go over the line, you're thinking, well, the salespeople are doing a great job. And sometimes it's very easy mm. to forget the things that go on in the background, whether that's marketing yeah. research, actual implementation, whether that's working on ads, working on demand generation, working on resources like podcasts, blogs, or doing SEO work. That stuff kind of ticks away, and you only really think about the deals that go over the line. So it is, like you say, very easily forgotten. But once yeah, it is taken say, away, you certainly see the, the impact. I think, and then I think us as marketers, at least I am a marketer, you're a marketer, but also the listeners, you should take responsibility for these things to be able to explain your organization. We are doing these things in marketing and we are doing those things because we believe A, B, C, D is going to equal uh, E or F or whatever it is. You need to explain to the CEO why are we doing it. You need to explain to the CFO why is this a meaningful activity. And yep. I think it's also a, it's a fair demand that for the we are requiring to budget typically a lot of money to you know to make a make an impact, and we need to be able to justify why are we demanding this amount of money, and if you're not able to justify this, then like how can you then expect to be given a, a large budget? Mm, mm, for sure, and we can talk about that shortly when we when we talk about kind of the measurement and attribution in a bit of finer detail. But before we do. What are some of the key things, let's say, in a B2B organization that really should be measured when it comes to marketing activity? Good question, Sam. I think it's uh, there's marketing that is easy to measure and then there's marketing that is harder to measure. And both things can be very, very uh, valuable to do both of them. There's uh, disciplines where you should really try to enforce measurement uh, particularly in the you know the performance end of the marketing spectra where you do have your clicks you do have your utms your referral links etc where you can actually very tangibly show that we did these activities or we bought these clicks or ads people arrived to our website and we produced revenue in those disciplines where it's very easy to measure your impact there should yep. be high demands for quantifiable metrics about how stuff works. Then there's other activities uh, that are harder to measure that might still be relevant to do. For example, we do a lot of uh, what we define as social selling on LinkedIn, which means basically connecting with our ideal customer profiles and then posting quality content in front of them. Uh, nine out of 10 times, we will not be putting any links into those posts. So, it's hard to directly attribute, uh, you know, outcomes from it, but it makes sense for us to do. So, you know, if we can continue to connect with the right people, if we can produce quality content and you can see people are liking it and engaging with it, then it must make sense to, to spend time on. And instead of you having like the tangible click to show to your colleagues, then you might want to be showing them that 
look at this, I, like VP marketing at this really I, ICP company just reshared our benchmarks or, you know, it's more like taking that screenshot of every time there's a, you know, a meaningful activity for our brand, I think you should be doing. And you should just realize that this is an activity that's hard to measure. So we have to battle a little bit for actually proving that it's worth the time. Because you have, if you have no proof at all that it's meaningful, then you're probably going to be asked to stop, <laughs> stop doing that activity. So yeah. I think that's that's the way I, I way I think about it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we've we've listed a couple of different angles there. So, like you say, if you're doing, if you're perhaps running paid advertisement, then you can use things like UTM codes. You can use Google Analytics or similar tools to track your website traffic. You can track the different source types. So if they've come through a certain paid ad if on seo maybe they've come through article or they've come from a certain mm. page you can then track things like you say time session times on your website the conversion rate whether they're converting into a filling out a form booking time on a calendar yeah. with a sales rep or clicking your phone number to give you a call so that all those things can be measured but then like you say when it gets difficult is when you're doing things like posting on social media whether that's linkedin creating content someone follows you, follows your content for a long time and eventually mm. goes to the website. As we know, the website's going to show that as a conversion from wherever their last touch was, whether that yeah, was direct or something or like direct that. Yeah. Or, that's when it all gets a bit tricky. So as, as you think, you should always ask yourself, is it the right people that we are communicating to right now? And do they get a quality piece of content in front of them? If those two things are ticked off, I think it's... Uh, I think you're doing the right thing essentially, and then the, it's going to some some of the things are going to be measurable, and other stuff is a bit harder to measure. And this this is where I think it's your responsibility to communicate to the organization why it's still meaningful to do it, even though it can be a little bit hard to to attribute to the, these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in terms of working with management teams, let's say. Perhaps you're a marketer and you've got to report to the C-suite. How do you recommend that people get buy-in for doing activities? I mean, it's probably quite, it's probably a lot easier to get buy-in on paid advertisement where you can, let's say it's Google search ads, Google AdWords, where you're literally paying X budget. People click through the ads and you can see how yeah. pretty much how many people are converting into leads or opportunities. Whereas when you're doing things that are a lot less measurable, like you say, posting on LinkedIn, perhaps daily content around your industry, giving tips, insights, mm. how tos, um, or maybe other things that can't be tracked. Maybe you're doing like LinkedIn advertisement, but not for direct leads. You're doing it to raise awareness. Yeah. So you're sending people to case studies, to articles, to build up yeah. brand rather than direct leads. How do you kind of convince management C suite that this is actually a smart idea and this long term is going to help the company with <laughs> revenue? Um... It's a t it's a challenge, and I think it's something that takes uh, it takes time. You know, I think marketing is also a meritocracy a little bit that you, you as you start a role, you start doing some stuff, and you start proving that you're able to to make things work. And as you make things work, you know, you can come back and ask for more. Um, I think uh, first of all, what you want to be doing is like. If you're in doubt that whether something works or is not working, you need to be proactive about it and say, "Listen, I tried this thing out, uh, yeah, and 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 I I simply cannot establish any proof that it's working. So, I had a hypothesis, I tested it out, and it didn't work. A lot of people, or like what used to be popular to be for a couple of years back, was be to to be a growth hacker, <laughs> and something that actually was I what I liked about the you can say that craft was that they actually were proponents of a, like a very structured approach to how you do experiments. So in for any, any given period, you would enter whether that's a two week sprint or a month sprint or something like that. You would arrive to this stage where you, you've written down all the ideas you have. You've written, you've scored them from easy to hard to do big business impact, small business impact, God feeling, no God feeling. And then you, rational you pick the ideas you believe to be the winners of those ideas that you have but then you run a quick test cycle whether that's a, like a 14 month trial period or like a month's trial period and as soon as that time period is over you do your evaluation 
do we feel that this is moving towards the right things or is it not moving to grow towards where we want to go? And if you have that systematic approach that you can share with your organization that look, and also this is a way to avoid your CEO coming in. Hey, I was at this conference and I had this idea. Let's, let's shift strategy completely. Yeah. Then always like have a structured approach to what are the activities that we are going to carry out? Which one of them do we think is the easiest and most impactful? Yeah. Then go try them out and then also return to the organization with how, how did we see this actually unfold? Yeah. And then you start a new period of ideas, list the ideas again. So I think the struct, it's about building trust through execution. Yeah. I love the idea of marketing experiments. And I think it's something that, in my experience, companies don't do enough of. Yeah. Because most B2B businesses are working with massive marketing budgets, but they're just sticking to the same kind of platforms that they know and that work to give them rather steady results. Because yeah. we're a kind of smaller organization and a bit more agile, we've got the flexibility where I can just say one day, right, I'm going to try mm. this channel for a month, yeah. three months. Let's see how it goes. If we make some revenue, yeah. it, great. If not, we've lost a few grand. <laughs> no worries. We don't do it again. We learn from it. Yeah. We move on to try yeah. the next channel. But in larger scale organizations, it's so much harder to spin those cogs, get approval and kick those things into yeah. place, right? I think that's the... Like, I think that's one of the things that has helped me improve the most as a marketer has been to like have a like a experimentation frame like mindset. Yeah. Come up with ideas, score them, test them, evaluate them, and do it over again. So there's nothing that is out that is forever. It's always a continuous test of let's try this, let's see how it works, and let's repeat it if it works. And then I think uh, it's important to also have this split of your kind of your. Your diesel engines that you know are always working and you can just, you know, like slowly put a little bit more money into it. But then you yeah. also need a lot of small experiments because at some point you're going to have exhausted the, like that big engine. You cannot, an example can be that there's not more search traffic to acquire on this term. You've acquired all the traffic that is out there on this thing. So you need yep. other kind of small engines where you test other stuff so they can kind of be part of your pillars of the future. So like whether that's like 70% solid stuff and then 20% pretty solid and 10% experiment, you, you need to figure that out in your organization. But you need to constantly be experimenting. But do not put all your eggs into the experimentation bucket because then your sales people <laughs> can run out of leads. Yeah. And I've been, I've been there, so don't do that. <laughs> Keep the solid stuff and then experiment with smaller experiments in it. Yeah, yeah, we've learned the hard way in the past too. So yeah, you've got, to, <laughs> got to be a little bit sensible with it, that's for sure. So let's try and get a bit actionable and go back to what we were talking about earlier. So perhaps I'll give you a scenario, Stefan. Perhaps we're, yeah. let's say we're a B2B company, maybe we're selling some kind of software. And perhaps up to now, we've scaled pretty well in terms of monthly revenue, just relying on, let's say, word of mouth referrals. Mm. Now we yeah. want to ramp up marketing. We want to ramp up advertising but we're not really sure what to do. Perhaps our CEO has kind of been to a few conferences, like you say, I've seen a few <laughs> webinars and thinks they should ramp a load of money in Google ads and LinkedIn ads. Um, but yeah. our marketers maybe want to do a few more experiments, want to get the team social selling as well as doing like demand gen with LinkedIn ads and perhaps, yeah. perhaps something else. How do, how do they set it, set it up from scratch so they can basically say, look, this is a system whereby we're going to, market it we're going to actually attribute and measure everything we can within our realm starting from scratch mm. and we're also going to kind of test other things so we can actually report i don't know monthly bi-monthly whatever you want to do to actually show yeah. the c-suite this is what we're doing this is how well it's going and these are like positive signals that we're actually kind of on the right tracks yeah i think you almost wrapped it up the same like i think it's <laughs> For every activity you do, you need to kind of define what does success look like uh, for this activity. You know, get a new BDR into the company and he needs to book 10 meetings a month, then we know that's working. And I think that that kind of thinking you can apply to all sorts of marketing experiments. What is it we're doing? What defines success? And how do we ensure that we can actually measure this? And like in this online world, for example, it would quite typically be that your website is your is your kind of your fishing boat, meaning that it, all the traffic is actually coming through your website. So you need to make sure that your website is wired 
uh, to actually being able to track activities and then referrals, etc. You know, and the simplest of tools to install would be to, or it used to be Google Analytics, but now there's GA4 and <laughs> now it's not that true anymore. But you need to make sure that when you put stuff into your website, they can actually understand and watch whether uh, it converts, whether it actually produces the business results that you're hoping for. So I would say, as I said before, start writing your experiments down, score them on the quality level that you feel they're at, but also establish a measurement system that you can then show to the rest of the organization. We tried these things, this is what we observed. We hit above or below the target, so we think we should either stop or we should do more of, uh, of this thing. Yeah, yeah, got it. So yeah, making sure you're, you're measuring as much as you can and then otherwise. Yeah, and I think actually, I think, a problem for some marketers are that they can be slaves of their uh, of creativity, so they kind of they continue to search for the new thing. Whereas, quite often, it's a lot better just to keep refining what are we doing already. And you know, if if it's possible to put K into an advertising uh, campaign that is already working, that is by far the easiest thing you can do, rather than you know. You have to reinvent the wheel coming up with a completely new idea and then try to see how that works. So, you know, if you find found oil just to keep drilling there instead of trying to come up with the, with the next idea. So I think that would also be to, you know, if the CEO comes with this new idea, you'd have to say like, look, we have this thing, it's working. We can prove that it's working. Are you sure you want to completely stop what is working in a, in a trade-off for doing something completely new? And if yeah. the CEO still wants to do that, maybe you should find another place to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's almost common sense, right? It's like well, if, for example, Google Ads is driving a good amount of rev- good amount of qualified leads that's producing a yeah. steady amount of revenue, and eventually you're going to hit diminishing, diminishing returns of how much you can cap because there's only so much yeah. search for certain keywords, certain phrases around your target yeah. market, your offer, then it makes sense to eventually experiment with other channels, whether it's social, whether that's outbound whether that's something else to to see what works yeah whether that's organic search like you say video podcast whatever you want to do to see see what results that brings over time set set a firm timeline and see how it goes um just to just to take the other side of the argument how do you what are your thoughts when we've got people like chris walker and the team at refine labs of course are Mm. almost going against the the model of trying to attribute things um, and going again kind of with dark social, which is more geared towards a little bit of what we touched on in terms of when content is perhaps shared in things that can't be tracked, be it Slack channels, Skype, internal messaging systems and such. Yeah. How, what's yeah, what's so your response for that? No, so I think I'm, I'm, there, I'm 100% sure that for all the clients that they have, they're also being asked to defend why have, are we spending this money that we're spending. And I think <laughs> to a large degree, I think it's just a narrative that they found that strikes uh, engagement because the fact is that you cannot walk into any like meetings with any bosses and not show any proof that stuff is working. And but of what I, where I do think that they have really uh, learned me something has been on the narrative of demand uh, capture versus demand uh, generation. And for me, I used to think everything should be measurable. I've now softened up a lot about that because you, you exhaust the bottom funnel quite fast and then you actually you need to move up and then you need to create some demand. You need to you know, get in front of the right people with the right messaging and then they move down your funnel. Like most people are not out uh, buying stuff all the time. They have like certain periods or contract periods that need to be uh, exceeded before they're ready to buy a new piece of software again. And then, and that's why I also like said initially, there's stuff that is harder to measure that is still super uh, valuable to do. Stuff like uh, social selling that creates, you know, we hear like in every second demo call we do, uh, they, people would mention, oh, I followed you on LinkedIn, et cetera. But that is hard for us to prove. It's not impossible to prove both through qualitative methods, but it does also leave traces when we do do the occasional link out of LinkedIn, people do come to our website. And I think any, 
if you're in doubt whether stuff works, it's because it doesn't. Because even the branding exercises, the dimension exercises will still leave a very significant proof if it's working well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of it, from my experience anyway, Stefan, I don't know if you'll agree, but some of it just comes down to kind of listening into sales calls or if you're conducting the sales calls yourself, then actually yeah. when you're talking to prospects, and you can do this on your inquiry forms as well, which is been exhausted on many podcasts adding the how do you hear about us field or failing that yeah. when you actually get on a demo call or a discovery call just saying look how did you stumble upon our brand what was the journey you took to chatting to yeah. me today and often that I think that the, some interesting com- some interesting th- thoughts yeah and I think that the discussion has been a little bit uh, been a little it's, it's often comes across a little bit too black and white it's not kind of mm, just because people can self-report it's not that you can't do like you know, measurable stuff. I think yeah. you should look at it as a, as a like as a supplement to each other. Like, you know, the quanti- quantifiable measurements have a certain advantage over the uh, not so quantifiable stuff. Like, you know, the self-reported answer. And one thing I will say is that we we did do a test because we also listened to this. You should try to you know do some self-reported attribution and we, we did a test on our website and you can find the you can find the case on our blog but we had like a self-reported field uh, where did you hear about us on our website for a hundred demo calls booked and if I, I think that the first lesson that I found was that a good self-reported where did you hear about us answer is a bit of a unicorn <laughs> I think less than 10% what it was of a quality that it, that it was dire- directional at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, it doesn't give you a lot of data about what's going on. The next thing is that it's very vague. You know, if somebody feels in, I heard you about you on Google. Okay, great. Or I heard about you on LinkedIn. But was it an ad campaign? Was it a search ad? Was it LinkedIn ad? Uh, which podcast was it? What, which topic did you like, etc.? cetera? Um, for us, that was a very weak, uh, it didn't change our opinion about anything. And I think when you do analysis, you do it for your, for you to change opinions on what you should be doing and not be doing. Yeah, yeah. I think from my from our experience as well, because we added it like, I don't know, six, seven months ago to our website forms. How did you hear about us? But we get much the same. But I think that's because we're probably similar in the fact that we're very much multi-channels. We're doing paid ads. We're doing a lot of SEO. We're doing a lot on LinkedIn. We're doing the podcast. We're doing an email list. So we'd get answers like, how did you hear about us? Google, internet, things like that, Mm. or LinkedIn. Like you say, they weren't very detailed. So I'd quite often go into sales calls and just ask the question again, like what was the route that you took to finding us today? And then you get the detailed insights that you could log in your CRM and then really start yeah. making some measurements on what's having an impact. I think the point is that you should not radically be blinded just trusting one thing. You need to kind of supplement your understanding of the situation, you know, self-reported, quantifiable stuff, your gut feeling, common sense. It's not either or, either or. You can always yeah. kind of make up your own conclusions. And if you're in doubt, ask your colleagues. Is, I've arrived at this conclusion because X, Y, Z. Is that is that a meaningful conclusion that I've arrived at? Yeah, I like that. Talking to your peers, getting their thoughts and feedback. Cool. Um, Stefan, good chat. Anything to to wrap things up with in terms of connecting marketing activity to revenue? Any final points? <laughs> no, I think I normally talk about like a, a ladder of three. So start coming up with your own narrative of why are we doing these things, which means like explaining, we do this activity, produce this kind of revenue, then test that narrative up against your peers, maybe your network. And then thirdly, make sure you bring, you do track data and do come up with the numbers that you can then show for why we should either continue to do these things that we're doing or we should stop doing the things that we're doing. Good man. And with that said, thanks very much for coming on the show. Please do tell us more about how everyone tuning in can learn more about Dream Data and if they want to connect with your good self. Yeah, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So people, you can just connect with me there and happy to reply any kind of questions that that you might have. Um, if you're in B2B, uh, then do check out dreamdata.io to, to, to see our website about how we can help you connect your marketing spend to, to revenue. 
nice one sir and we'll put all of those links over in the show notes over <laughs> at businessgrowth.marketing and with that thanks once That's again great, on. enjoy the chat thank you sam have a nice day no worries and as always if you enjoyed today's episode why not leave us a quick review on the audio podcast or if you're on youtube a quick subscribe and we'll catch you on the next one for more actionable no bs marketing tips to grow your business and grow your revenue <laughs> cheers for tuning in <laughs>